Good afternoon, guys. How are you doing? Good to see you. Good, yeah. thanks. Brilliant. Back again, Ian. Yes, we are. Be well. Work well. must be picking up. <laughs> Just a little bit. Or, um, or you've been busy finishing off a big project. Well, maybe it just happens. So yes, it does. It just happens that we have as well. How's um and and not just that. Obviously, twelfth of twelfth of April for all those guys down here in the south. So me, Richard, and Alex, and uh, yeah, we're opening up and uh, pools are looking good and it's um it's getting there. Yeah, we're we're in we're in the steam company today. We've got Alex Blackwell and we've got Richard Lamburn. We we've got two pillars of the community and gurus in the swimming pool industry. So we're blessed. We're blessed with our company today, Ian. Yeah. So I'm 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 glad to say we've actually well joined from with Alex Blackwell from uh, Water Babies and Richard from Swim England. And um finally Alex, mate, I can talk about it now. That's the that's the yeah. thing I want to get off my chest. Because oh my god, I can talk about this now. Um so Robin didn't even know much about this, but uh, obviously um I think, Alex, you're probably better starting off with telling us sort of what we've been up to and how this all came about. Yeah, so we had an opportunity through Water Babies. We had a contact with Imperial College London and uh, um, we were speaking with them and mentioned, you know, wouldn't it be nice to just test swimming pool water with the real virus, you know? Uh, and uh, through the contact, they said, well, you know, they, they, they better do that for us. And we were like, really? You know, that's just fantastic. You know, what an opportunity here. Uh, and then, you know, very early on, um, I felt, well, hang on, we need to involve the governing body, Swim England. So I got on the phone to Richard and said, look, we've got this opportunity. You, you know, do you want to progress it? And that's sort of like where it started. That was like nine months ago. And we thought, well, this would be quick and easy. But but no, <laughs> you know, it, it took a little bit of time, but it, it was good. Brilliant. So for someone like myself, uh, looking from the outside in, because uh, I know the three of you have, have worked very, uh, very hard, especially Ian and Alex, on the, the processes involved in this. Uh, I know, Ian, I've spoke to you a few times and you've been collecting water and samples and so on. So there's been quite a, a lot of work gone into this. And I know, Richard, you've been doing a lot of conversing with the guys. So from layman's terms, can I, what was the the first part of the process, what did you have to do? Where did you have to go? I mean, uh, for the listeners and the watchers, where did you go? What did you do? Did you did you go out and get COVID and then just go in and get <laughs> tested and then, guys, this is perfect, go for a swim and then we'll sort it out? Because people will have these sort of questions. I'm, I'm going to leave this to you two guys, only, uh, <laughs> so, no, only because is I didn't initially come into the project at the start. I came in shortly after the start of the project. Um, so there was a bit before me, shall we yeah. say. Yeah, so I mean, the way it worked was we picked up water from uh, uh, one of the pools in London. Um, then we drove it to Imperial College London where they have a high containment lab. The water was prepared uh, you know, in a diff different area and then we essentially handed it over and they took it down to high containment level where, where we didn't go. So we didn't do all the testing. We had some really good support from uh, Kingfisher Environmental. They helped us initially. Um, and then in the end, it was just easier due to the logistics of picking up the water, who's going to take it, getting the bottles. I thought, actually, let's speak to Ian. And it'd be a lot easier if just myself and Ian work together, get the water, adjust the levels ourselves if, if needed. It just, just took the pressure off and, and it was just easier uh, logistical wise um, uh, because in Pimples London are very, very, very busy. So we worked around their availability uh, and that's what we had to do. And um, yeah, we took it from there. So. You know, to start with, it, it, we had a few challenges which we overcome, which was just a learning experience. And we were worried about that. But actually, speaking to lots of other scientists, we've speaking to um, you know, John Lee, Rachel Chalmers, uh, Ellen Mayo in America. It, it's quite normal, quite routine. But once we got the process uh, 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 refined, we were able to get, get, get good results. I mean, what Alex missed off is the sort of first stage where we did trial the sheep dipping. But, uh, it, you know, it was it proved quite difficult sort of in logistics terms. <laughs> no, but on a serious note, just from obviously our perspective and our involvement, was just that element of validating, you know, the guidance that we had out there to get pools open. And we felt it was essential. And as soon as Alex sort of, you know, brought forward the proposal, we felt, you know, it was something that we had to be involved in and we had to support with. 
um, and such an essential piece of work, really. And Ian, see from the yours and, and my perspective, the, the pool plant, the water treatment perspective, variables are massive. You and I know that, uh, you know, when we're doing uh, assessments, audits, variables yeah. come in, are, are, are massive. So what were the main kind of variables that you had to try and bottom out when you were doing um, the analysis? To be fair, we didn't know if there would be variables depending on the pool itself, its design, its technology, you know, the age of the pool, age of filtration. There's lots of variables in that part um, initially. And also, to give you a bit of an idea, when I'm, when I'm dealing with water, I'm dealing with 500 tonnes of water. Um, and reality is, and Alex will say this, we were collecting somewhere between 5 to 15 litres usually, uh, depending on what how many tests we had. The, the, the problem that we had as well with the Imperial College London, which was, as Alex said, is they had lab time, so we had to flex to their lab time. You've got a booked lab slot. So we would have to go prior to that lab slot, have all of it prepped. We Maybe then we'd have a lab slot in the afternoon, so it would have to be prepped for that time and then taken to the lab. So me and Alex were against the clock as well, um, preparing the samples, that's fair to say. And then the other thing which was a bit of a challenge is we were preparing exact samples for um, one litre of water not one cubic meter, one liter of water. And I think, would it be fair to say, Alex, at the start, we kind of didn't know where we were. So what I mean by that is we, I think one of the first samples, we, we tried 30 milligrams per liter of free chlorine <laughs> to see if it would do anything at the virus. Um, because we, we just didn't know. We just We didn't know, did we, at all? Um, yeah, that was just proof of concept. We started off at like hmm. 1.5. 5, 10, 15, and worked our way up. Just you know, the first few tests, just to to try and uh, uh, um, you know get 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 the base results to to check the methodology uh, uh, was correct, and um, that just took a little bit of time. And um, there were a few challenges at the beginning, which we overcome the way they produce the virus, and um, the virus is produced in in, in cells. Um, and I think it's important to say here that none of us are scientists here, so we're speaking in very much yes. layman terms what we've learned about i'm not a scientist so you know, i'd have to leave that to um jonathan brown who we work very closely with and wendy barclay but um uh, and they are going to produce a paper for us but they produced the uh covid19 uh in um uh, kidney cells uh, and then they'd wash the uh virus out of the kidney cells and you just have the virus left and and uh, the problem was that you'd have a buffer that the virus was in and we found that that buffer initially was inactivating the chlorine um, so we weren't able to get a clean test of COVID-19 and swimming pool water and it took a little while just to overcome those challenges and in the end they worked out a way of um, the buffer was just a saline solution with, with, with the virus uh, with the live virus and then obviously saline solution it didn't have a, a, a negative effect on the um, swimming pool sample and then back to Ian's point you know we were then you know the scientists were just using a really small amount of swimming pool water adding the virus and then measuring how long it took to inactivate it and I think what they were doing after 30 seconds uh, they inactivated the chlorine and then then they'd use their technique to uh, measure how much of the virus was active or inactive and we'd find the results it took about five days each time didn't it yeah, so gen generally we always found that because of the prep of the sample, it was usually a Thursday or a Friday, wasn't it, Alex? And then yeah. it was always the following sort of Wednesday, Thursday sort of thing would um, get results back, which is, it was also, it was also I, I don't know about Alex, but it was a bit of nervous anticipation as well at times, like, you know, sort of because the, the test would then influence the next round of testing as to where we were going to go with chlorine levels or pH or whatever it might have been or, or where we're going to re-sample the exact same figures to confirm that that wasn't just yeah. a... An anomaly and it, it worked or it didn't work or um yeah and in the end i mean we'll do a webinar eventually of, of these with the pictures and we'll show you so I, i've got boxes of um sterile bottles here you know uh, sample collection bottles um we had a, a a chiller box so we'd collect the water test the water at the pool do the whole suite of tests collect the sample and the way we did it was you know we'd open the bottle underwater fill it up, uh, let that water sit for a minute, empty it out, then put the lid on, open it up underwater, let it fill up, shut the lid on underwater, then put it in the in, in the cool box, ready for transportation to the lab. 
Um, so we have to be so careful because it, we're using such small samples of water. Obviously, any contaminants or variables, the chlorine is going to start being used up on the journey to to the lab, you know. So that took a bit of time uh, uh, and management. And then also, you know, if there was a delay between us prepping the water and then being able to do the experiments, the chlorine might dissipate. So um, we have some really good um uh, uh, support from Jonathan and he, he got some lab support as well so they could do the tests quicker you know and also myself and Ian got quite adept at adjusting the pH and chlorine levels we were you know trying to get I mean Ian you say you know we're trying to get you know 1.5 parts per million and adjusting it it's not easy when you're working with one litre of water no so now so now Ian you're like like the, the janitor that's been working at the pool for 35 years where he says ah that amount to get 1.5 into the pool, you know, and that's what you feel like now, you know. And Richard, just see during the process, obviously you had communication links with, with the guys. Um, did you have to feed that back into Swim England? Was there a kind of hotbed of, you know, anticipation waiting on the, the results? Yeah, our anticipation, obviously, as soon as I sort of made it clear that we were engaging and, and you know, commencing the process, Every other week, you know, if we got that research done, is it done yet? You know, and you know, it took you know nine months, and it's it's the first time it's been done. And we're talking, like you say, like Alex says, the quantities of water that they're doing are so small to get that balance. Then the quantities of water are only a few mil that go through to the lab. Then you've got challenges along the way. There wasn't just a straight up methodology from a you know a similar paper that we could have just you know simulated into this. And um, so you know, it was it was key, but. I suppose early on, you know, not only just swimming when, but predominantly through, you know, PewTag had, you know, were, were strongly confident in terms of the guidance that we had uh, put out in terms of chlorine levels and pH levels in deactivating and reducing the risk of COVID uh, due to, uh, you know, existing knowledge we had on similar envelope viruses. But it was just, it's just that consumer confidence point of view that we wanted to get across. You know, everyone's been living obviously in and in, an environment and you know concern of risk of transmission and one of the areas that I have been you know campaigning obviously for have been safe for the last 12 months swimming pool environments one of the safest environments in terms of reducing the risk of transmission of COVID you know if we talk about water we could talk about air and you know the number of air changes per hour we do the amount of fresh air we introduce into our buildings uh, you know I think it's just great that we finally got it over the line and we got it released on the 12th of April as pools hopefully opened for the last time in terms of there is no closure again and no reopening dates uh so i think it's just a great piece of work and alex and ian did you know all of the all of the legwork was done by them you know um, I, I can't take any of the the credit away from them for the amount of time and effort that they both put in for it what was interesting thanks richard i mean we did look at i know jonathan looked at the papers on the flu virus so there some research papers there and the methodology of testing the flu virus uh, what they were able to do there though was test the chlorine levels after they had um, added in the uh, uh virus so what we did in the end and they they gave us an inactivated covid19 they then inactivated under uv light they gave that to us with the buffer and we measured to see what was the chlorine load with with um inactivated uh COVID-19 which is very interesting so we could you know rule out some of the variables and what we could see was that the virus wasn't using up all the chlorine and uh, we could see it would work uh, and then we did varying different pH levels and what was interesting you know as the pH went higher the, the the free chlorine wasn't as effective so that supports the current guidance from Swim England and uh, PewTag you know on, on the need to uh, keep your pH at the lower ranges within the guidance now. Ian, was there, uh, no, that, that's a, a really, really interesting point, Alex. And Ian, was there any feedback from the scientists about the, the pH? Because you know, obviously you and I have sat in rooms where pH, mm -hmm. people have talked about pH being king, you know, and it's more important than free well, chlorine itself. Uh, we have that discussion many times. Uh, was, there, was there a lot of feedback from the scientists regarding... The, the pH and its relationship to free chlorine? Um, there, there was, but the one thing I did find it interesting was because these guys, these guys were PhDs and, and, and doctorates and, and, you know, highly, been to university for years, highly qualified people. And then there was me walking in with some pool chemicals and, uh, you know, balancing out this bit of water. And they were fascinated by it. 
Do you remember that? Yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, how do you then, want to put in? How, and I was just like, they're not water chemists. They're not water chemists. They're they're not, you know? they're not. And and I was like, and they and they were in awe of me being able to just prep the sample. And it was it was quite funny. We're like, well, we we can do that quick. And I'm just done and <laughs> take it off. Um, so that was that was quite interesting. But no, the thing was that with the research coming back, and that's where it was really much led. So. As I say, the, the, very much the first round I was involved in, which I think was the third round, Alex. Was it the third or the fourth? Third or fourth, that? yeah. Um, once at this point we'd sorted out the buffer and we knew that the buffer was fine and how we were going to have to do it and, and bring it in saline and stuff, that it was a case of, right, let's try a few samples and let's see what happens. So there was a series of tests that we did at um, 1.5 free chlorine with a series of pHs. Um, and also the other thing which was interesting is and when we got there, we'd, we'd find out on the day how many slides and how many attempts we've got. Um, so it wasn't always the same, was it, Alex? Because depending how well uh, and how much virus was available, because the virus was in demand from lots of other industries as well, you know, for, for to be tested against um, other products. You know, I'm, I'm sure there was other products and other industries asking for it. But it became pretty clear, um, and with the scientists, that when we'd done a series of tests, where would we want to move our test next? Um, I think it was also the time it took and they didn't know the quality of the virus until they'd made it and produced it, the quality of it and the amount they would get, um, uh, you know, but I, uh, yeah, there were, it, it was very interesting and they tried the virus at different dilution factors as well yeah. uh, with um, the amount of water that was needed. So, um, you know, there was quite a bit of learning early on, but again, speaking to all the scientists that we have through this project, it's, the learning we've had is pretty similar to the learning mm -hmm. the other scientists have had with similar uh, experiments like Legionella and other envelope viruses. Like I said, no, they had, they all had exactly the same challenges. Uh, and once we overcame them, we were able to get consistent results, you know. And was temperature a factor? Couldn't manage on temperature due to the small amount that we did. Mm. You know, I think I think what we've done. You know, this is a comparatively small study, uh, uh, and it's been fantastically funded by Water Babies, um, Swim England, and, and the RLSS. Uh, you know, and it'd be you know, you start a study, you always want to do more, and I, uh, temperature would be a really interesting one to do. You know, mm. we'd assume that as the temperature gets higher, it might be even better. You know, but we didn't. Fact, uh, temperature wasn't a factor in, in this research at this stage. Mm. I think one of the things that the guys were just saying, you know, about how, you know, Ian joined at sort of, you know, around three or four, and we had plenty of challenges, as we've mentioned. But, you know, it's been mentioned, why didn't we release it sooner? You know, we had to have, it had to be validated. You can't just get, you know, you, if you get your round of results, you've got to repeat it again and again and again and continually receive the same result. Yeah. You know, that validation has got to be there in order for us to have made anything public. So we would have loved to have released it months and months ago. But unfortunately, you know, it's, you know, the first of its kind, it had its challenges. Um, we got over them. And yeah, like Alex says, further research definitely wouldn't, you know, would would, would be helped by what we've done already. Um, and I think what we'll probably do is, you know, I'm happy to pass it on to, you know, the industry, yeah. any governing bodies, if they're prepared or are able to access funding and uh, progress this. Now we've got a methodology that we know works. Uh, you could do temperatures and you could try lower, you know, even lower samples of um, uh, uh, free chlorine, et cetera, and temperatures and pH and, you know, even different disinfection methods we could uh, now we know. But uh, obviously we, we chose um, chlorine first because that's most pools. I don't know how many pools is it in? You, you survey uh, most pools. 97% or something are, are chlorine-based disinfectant in the UK. Oh, so right, Richard. Most pools yeah. chlorine disinfection, Richard. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, most and, of, and, yeah, yeah, Andrew said, yeah, yeah. And it's Putag recommended, uh, you know, Putag don't recommend any other types of uh, disinfection apart from chlorine based at the moment. So uh, for to have backing from Putag, you probably had to go down that route, really. If, see, for an industry, what would, just to sum it up in like a, a strap line almost, what could a Greenwich Leisure or, you know, people for places or, or or places leisure, what could they now say to their customers as a result of your hard work? I think you it's can't, you can't proof. Catch, Yeah, you can't catch COVID-19 through swimming pool water. Obviously, yeah. you've still got the social distancing. If you're standing next to someone and they're breathing, you know, over you and they, you know, obviously you've still got, you know, but this is through the water that we've, we've tested. So it's, 
you know, you know, in other environments, I don't know where people can touch surfaces, etc. You've got the, the the chance of it being passed on in that dynamic. So we we now know due to the dilution factor and 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 the chlorine, the chance of catching it through or from swimming pool water is is negligible. Yeah, we, we you know we all know that you can't provide a completely risk free environment. You know, it's it's impossible. But what we have done is we've evidenced that through everything from the way in which we manage our facilities you know, through online booking systems to changing room capacities to cleaning regimes to air handling, you know, uh, rates and the way in which we manage that. So now knowing that inside the water it can't be transmitted, it's pretty much, you know, a very low risk uh, activity uh, in Mm. terms of, you know, transmission of COVID. So I think what we've done is just given that consumer confidence back really. um, And yeah, hopefully people can be encouraged to, you know, return to the pools. Yeah, that's a good line, isn't it? Return to the pools. I like yeah. to. Yeah. <laughs> Return to the, the pools. Is, the other I'm line, is follow, the, follow the guidance is the other line. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. To the operator, follow yeah. the guidance is the other one. Absolutely. Uh, you know, yeah. we, all we've done is demonstrate that you need to follow the guidance, you know, and pH is key. Uh, follow it. And I think outside of this research as well, I mean, this is just an example of how collaborative we've become as, a, as an industry as well. The fact that, you know, we've worked so closely with. Alex and Water Babies, the RLSS's involvement, as well as Pew Tags. Let's not forget um, the Spartex Foundation as well, and Chris Hayes at Sparta and the support they've given us. Sport England as well have been, you know, keeping tabs on this as well. Um, so I think it's just been really, you know, this one yeah. piece of work I mean, evidences I'm, I'm that collective at, nature. I'm just looking at the list. Lovey Bonds lent me some kit. We picked up water from Surrey Sports Park, HTH Segura, Ellen Mayer from America, Rachel Chalmers, John Lee, Kingfisher, um, you know, environmental. There were lots of people who, who helped and had input. Ian Nix, uh, Simon Crook did some water testing with me from the RLSS as well. Two the know, Remember Tooting as well. So two yeah, not, yeah the, the pools that provided the samples, those Tooting. operators that went in and got them as close yeah. to the parameters that we requested. Well, Tooting were brilliant because, you know, in lockdown, they would adjust, they'd adjust the main pool to 1.5 parts per million. They'd adjust the learner pool to 1.7 parts per million for us. So, so we wouldn't have to too much, do too much uh, adjusting in the lab. Um, we had we had a few challenges uh, um, uh, on, on other days, and we had to adjust it. But sometimes, you know, on the last few rounds, the water was where we needed it to be, and all we had to do was adjust the pH to the required levels, and it was really good. I think I think what's also really good, which I like to take away from the, towards the end of the project, is we actually got our methodology down. Um, you know, we put the methodology down, we documented the methodology, because at this point we'd learned the methodology. So um, as Alex quite rightly said, if someone wished to take the project on and move on to the next level, look at other parameters, other base disinfectants, whatever it might be, other pH ranges outside of what we would have done. They've now, they, they won't have the trial and error, so to speak, that we had right at the start, Alex. Is that fair? Um, yeah, I mean, to be fair, you should see the pictures, which we'll be able to share with you eventually of Ian adjusting the water. I mean, uh, you know, we pick, pick up in... in, in uh, uh, sample bottles that was you know they were all sterile then it was in a, a dark cool box transported then we kept everything in the dark uh, 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 then Ian would have his mask on his gloves on his apron on uh, and then a sterile test tube every time to extract the water from from, from the sample bottle then to do a pool test uh, we double t- double checked the test each time for DPD one you know it, it just double double checked it uh sometimes we use two machines you know just to make sure that everything was accurate um uh and it was just an extremely strict process uh um you know um of, of how the uh, samples were adjusted then they were put in a fridge and they were taken down uh, and then we'd pass them on we weren't involved at that stage they were taken down to level three containment where they'd uh, take a sample and add a bit of um covid19 uh inactivate the chlorine after 30 seconds and then using their science they could measure how much was it inactivated or not and it's very interesting you can see on the graphs that they gave us you know at different ph levels that you know at the 1.5 ph of 7 7.2 no virus left and as the ph started going up to higher levels more virus was was left viable virus was left and that that was very interesting but that also showed that our methodology was right because it showed that at different pH levels, some virus was still up, still still uh, viable, but it showed that our technique was working as well. And all that all that evidence uh, will be published in one document, and will that be 
available to operators, the public? Because you know what? The listeners are going to be like, they're going to be like, I want to see that. I want to read that. I want to have access to it. It's going to be made available on, on a server that the scientists are currently writing at the moment. It's not going to be published or peer reviewed in that sense in a journal. But it's just going to be made available. Uh, and then maybe, you know, if there's other governing bodies or funding want to take it further and expand on the research and science, they may decide that they want to publish it and get it peer reviewed. So this is the initial study, uh, just to confirm mm. that, you know, yeah, we know that chlorine uh, in activates the work. Quite clear to say as well, um, for anyone who's obviously not familiar with peer review, we did we did look at peer review, but the problem was is that they said it could take up to a year, um, and that 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 was a bit of a time constraint for us because close to the start of this year we were close to the final results, so to speak. We knew we were where we knew what was happening. Um, I think that's fair to say, Richard, isn't it? Um, yeah, without a doubt. Yeah, and it, it, like I say, we're for peer review. We we sort of. Yeah. And come to a point of wherever there's a need, you know, the real need was to get it out there to, as soon as possible. We spoke, but to, we spoke to scientists about peer review, uh, just in process, and they, they were saying it could be anything up to a year, and, and you basically have to approach the journal, and they, they'll say whether they want to do it. But the problem that we thought was, um, we really wanted this evidence initially. I know it tended up to be the 12th of April, which was just pure luck. Let's be honest, guys. <laughs> we should have lottery tickets on that. Um, but we wanted it to um, to be out. ideally we were hopefully planning maybe the week before lockdown initially, weren't we? Before the twelfth of April, um, so then on the twelfth we could open up with lots of confidence. Um, but unfortunately, because of timing and other uh, unfortunate news stories in the press and stuff, it just it wasn't the right time to um, to uh, bring that our own press release forward. Um, and we felt that if we did peer review it, and this evidence now what we're talking about came out in 2022, when hopefully all of us here around the room will be saying, COVID, what COVID? Um, it just wouldn't have worked. I think we've done a good initial study to start the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, uh, other scientists around the world will make it available, can take it on board and, and, and continue that, that research. And we're more than happily... Uh, help with that but from our point of view it's giving that extra confidence because we've already seen studies with other envelope viruses you know so so it's given that real confidence and and you know i think this is world leading we are one of the first i, I believe we're one of the first i'm not aware of any other studies where people are actually using real swimming pool water and, and real you know covid19 i'm and not aware of any other studies that have taken place and as well, well the other thing uh, without it, it it's tens of thousands of pounds that's been spent on this Yes, guys, that's, that's we know what's yeah. in this. And it's, I mean, ten, it's, it's tens of thousands of pounds, isn't it? It's it's in the thousands and thousands and thousands. I mean, I've got to just hat off to water babies and swim England. You know, a, a swimming mm. let we don't run pools, we don't own pools, we don't operate pools. You know, we we hire pools in the main, but with this opportunity, um, you know, for a swimming lesson provider to uh, part fund it uh, with. Um, Swim England, RLSS, and uh, Spartex Foundation. You know, it it was really truly collaborative. Really, I don't I don't think the funding could have happened if it was just one individual yeah. body. We wouldn't have had the, the the money to be able to do it. Um, uh, so that that's worked really really well. Uh, the you know, without the collaboration, I don't think it would happen. And it's not just financial. It's it's the pools that provided the water. You know, Kingfisher and uh, you know Segura and Lovey Bond, and, you know everyone else, yeah. you know who supported. You know, I, you know I, I haven't had to pay to bowl the you know, water test kits, the sample bottles. They've all been provided. Everyone's given their time for free. Even Ian, you know, so you know, so, so um, it has been gives gives you that warm glow in the heart. You know what I mean? Do, do you hear that, Robin? Ian gave his time for free. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sure I'm that paying for it, Robin. Uh, I've just got this uh, feeling that I'm going to pay for it. <laughs> you, you better believe it. You better believe it. See when the pubs <laughs> open back up. That's you. You're in. You know he's. He's he going to be able to test the pint before he drinks it. I yeah, uh, he, 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 yeah. That will come back to haunt you, Alex. That's for sure. You know. I've got a <laughs> but listen, well done, guys. Absolutely, uh, sterling effort during. Uh, our war against COVID-19, so to speak. But yeah, I mean, the, the results, uh, you know, whether whether they were positive or negative, uh, it's almost, you know, irrelevant, although it is not irrelevant, but the work that you put in is the, the important thing in the methodology. And, uh, you know, obviously the result was a positive one. It was, 
it, it, it almost reiterates what the, the guidance is from Richard's point of view. He must have been celebrating yeah. big there time was, when the results there was a came through. Times, yeah, we were, we were said, <laughs> there was one of these kind of I told you so moments. I knew it, knew it. It was one of those ones where I told you those guidance, Ralph Riley. I told you that was going to be spot on. The, the pH of seven and the one point five. But yeah, no, it's uh, it's, it's fantastic news. Um, how do you think it will impact long term, or do you think there's going to be any impact? Do you think it's going to help long term, or is it more short term? Uh, what what do you guys think? Will there be a ripple effect on this in a positive way? I'll hand, I'll hand over to Richard and Ian. I mean, my my Kenneth Worth would be you know it underpins the need you know for us to maybe get in line with the DIN standards in Europe, maybe. So over to Richard and. Ian on keeping your pH a little bit lower, do you think, or not? Yeah, I mm. think I think the positive steps, sort of what we can take out of this, you know, there's a lot to learn, isn't there, really? And we're talking about, you know, the new the new norm, you know, because it's not going to be COVID guidance anymore. We need to think about how we bring that into the way in which we run pools, you know, full, full stop. And highlighting, I think, the importance as well, which we've been going on about as, as tutors, PPO tutors for years and years about the importance of pH. And, and, and free chlorine and the relationship there and I, I can just you know picture Nixie now you know with, with his, his presentation on free available chlorine uh, <laughs> I think we've all got a copy active yeah. active active yeah. <laughs> but I just think it'll be great in terms you know I think it's positive that we can take this and take it to approach to everything you know wherever it is covid wherever it is whatever virus that we might get next you know that we know you know the importance of managing our pools bringing ph down um you know sensible operation you know there's an element you know that we've been talking about air as well and, and air change rates but i don't want to detract too much about introducing fresh air and not not worry about the issue of you know carbon footprint of, of facilities you know and not detract away from that so i think what it's done is just Brought us hopefully it's educated parts of the sector and hopefully educated those that hold some of the funding as well in terms of investment in our swimming facilities and that we can use this as a platform to campaign for more investment to improve our facility stock not only in terms of a carbon footprint but the way you know the quality of our pools the quality of our water that makes the experience better all around yeah no definitely the, the one thing as well i like to think a take away from it is, is we've seen you know, in the background, obviously, these tests were going ahead. But, you know, when you think about the first lockdown, Robin, and how the government reacted, you know, we saw restaurants and pubs open before pools and we all sort of like, what, what's, what's going on? Mm -hmm. And, you know, in the background, obviously, the government then had track and trace and the track and trace evidence could show us actually, you know, gyms and gyms and swimming pools, there is very, very low mineral risk of transmission of COVID-19, uh, you know, from just from track and trace data. So, and this time around, obviously, we've now seen gyms and pools open up prior to pubs indoors and restaurants indoors, which is great. Um, but I think, so we've got evidence base of that. And now we've also got evidence base of, as we said, transmission through water. It, it basically, if you run your, your chlorine and pH levels at the correct range, it's not gonna happen. Um, you know, it's negligible. It's, it's you know, it's so insignificant, it's, it's just not there. So hopefully, you know, heaven forbid that the country does go into like a lockdown for, oh, I just I can't you know, believe that might happen, but, we now have much more evidence just from sources of saying, well, actually, pools, um, you know, are, are uh, you know, as safe as we can get them yeah. as an environment. Yeah. I, think, I think just as what Ian said there, just obviously a bit of data, I suppose, just to clarify, back up what Ian said there. From point at which pools opened to mid-January, we, we had uh, an FOI request from uh, Public Health England. So in England, less than 5,000 positive results in terms of, you know, a positive test of someone from COVID that swam between three and 12 days prior to that result. So it doesn't mean they contracted it there, but less than 5,000. I think it was something like 0.004%. You compare that to the amount we had swimming as well in that period. Again, it's ridiculously low. Um, yeah. So, you know, we have the data as well that proves that all of that and pubs above pools was, you know, a, a financial decision, wasn't it, really? The pubs above pools, I mean... You know, we don't want to knock other industries, but you know, no, if no. tears if tears do come back in, the tier system, what I'm hoping is that maybe this research will help. You know, if, if their tier system does come in, maybe pools won't necessarily be the, some of the first to shut if it happens again in the future. That you know, that would be a good outcome. 
uh, uh, um, with the data backed up from what Rich has just said and with our research and then if you follow the guidance and all the other rules that need to be there. But, you know, it might, might help keep the pools open for longer, hopefully, you know, but we don't want to be there again. Hopefully, well, we I, I am grateful for a pub being open. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah, don't make, yeah. Hang on, it's yeah. Friday. Yeah, be careful what I'm saying here. Yeah, keep yeah. the pubs open. <laughs> yeah. You'll get barred from your local soon if you don't watch that. Do you know the one thing, Robin, as well? How popular is this podcast? I'm just checking. <laughs> <laughs> the, the one thing I, um, I, I will say I did certainly take away from the end of this is I had a, actually a little bit of a sense of pride um, at the end of it because. Um, I mean, I, I, I've got to take my hat off to Alex and Water Babies for a lot of the organisation part and being sort of the almost, um, I don't know if this is the right term, Alex, but almost being the conductor and bringing all the band members together, you know, to in one spot so that we could play the music, so to speak. But, um, the, 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 I mean, uh, uh, heaven forbid, but the, I reckon there must have been 20 or 30 individuals or organisations that brought together to make that. And it's the first time I'd really seen our industry all put, differences to one side you know competing companies and such like in some cases and just throw everything out the wind and say right we're going to all pull together coordinate this get this done and that was the sense of pride i had for it that everyone just basically said you know what we need this and we need to get it done and you know and richard um certainly have seen it as well and you know the emails pinging back and forward and trying to get things organized and who's meeting where yeah. and calls with America and you know people from all over the world and that are interested parties uh, yeah it's really you know even even I've met a lot of new people from this a lot of experience a lot of scientists a lot of um, people involved in polls all over the world getting their opinion and and how it happens and what it does it, it's just yeah I mean Eva I, I well pull so I know a lot about polls but it's taken me to another level <laughs> it really has really has so I've, I've got a sense of pride over the whole project if to be honest um even though my part was relatively small um yeah don't underestimate it Ian. don't underestimate it i definitely concur with everything you said there Ian. i mean you know in the press release alex and what you know was project manager I, I don't think that really does in you know justice really because without you know his time and effort to pull everything together we wouldn't have been where we would have been you know we were extremely stretched as an organization my resources were tight and alex really you know went out, out you know and yeah it's down to him really to pull everyone together and you know rather grateful and like you say it's something that we're proud of as a piece of work and we got there we got something you know we've got we've seen that we we've got all the data we've seen the data hopefully everyone else will be able to see that within the coming weeks as well yeah it will be good brilliant brilliant superb well done guys a wee Thank pat you. in the back uh hold it up <laughs> Delighted to hear the results, uh, and it's uh, been extremely enlightening to hear about your efforts uh, and uh, the detail that, uh, that was required in pulling us all together. Um, yeah, you, you should all be proud of your efforts, and uh, you know we're, we're we're hopefully we're coming out of this soon. So this is a this is a wee bit of a uh, you know one of those one of those achievements in the background throughout a very very challenging and tough time but something that you, you can all be proud of in terms of oh you know be you could you know a lot of the industry could have been could have felt sorry for themselves but uh it's it's great to see you uh taking a positive approach to to the the challenges that, that we had over the last 12 months or so so well done to you all yeah and uh, we look forward to seeing the results officially published and uh, yeah, we can uh, we can ha we can go to our swimming pools in Scotland well, very I think soon. Our aim is once we get the paper published, we'll um, uh, not published but available. Uh, mm. um, once once it's it's been written up by um, Imperial College London, we'll make that available. I think maybe we'll speak with Richard from England, RLSS, uh, maybe Simsfer, and um, do a few webinars maybe, and we can show 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 the results and the graphs and show in a bit more detail. Um, but I, I, I'm quite conscious that we need to make sure that paper is viewed by Swim England and PewTag first before we make it publicly available because, you know, they may Absolutely. want to consider, you know, that it's important. We don't just, uh, well, I don't want these people to look at their paper and start changing the way they do things. The, the bottom line is follow the guidance and hopefully this research will help help people in, you know, decide, you know, what direction to go in in the future, you know. Possibly PewTag maybe bring out a technical note i don't know that remains to be seen so yeah. 
like, um, I'm conscious it needs to be you know through, through swim england they're the link yeah. and, you, know, you know they're the governing body and, and i think once the paper's available they can uh, use their channels to decide how, how it's best managed what i don't want to do is just make it available i don't want the industry changing things unless it's done through you know the right channels Perfect. fantastic can we all go to the pub now then yeah <laughs> thanks for joining us today and um and uh, well yeah i hope we'll speak to us soon and uh, yeah let's get back to pools yeah absolutely let's go get swimming then we can have a beer richard afterwards we'll, we'll go and earn our pint yeah, we'll go and earn it. Go and earn it. yeah don't go for, to the pub first then swimming <laughs> that goes against the grain yeah it's a good idea well done it? well Cheers. done guys uh thanks again for taking the time out to to let the listeners and the viewers uh, inform them about uh, your 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 efforts and and what you've been doing over the last twelve months. So that's a uh, thanks for that too. Um, anything else to add, Ian? No, just uh, thanks for the guys for joining us. It's been great that we could have you on this afternoon, and um, yeah, we'll probably all speak to you soon. But uh, it's uh, goodbye from us all then. Bye now. Thanks. thanks. Guys.